missile on diagnostics and replication. Diagnostic plots, residuals, all the tabs and flavors, heteroscedastatistics. It's the bread and butter, baby. What a jam! Hoo-wee. What a way to introduce heteroskedasticity and how we're going to try to transform some data to correct it in this, the final lecture of week 9 for BIOS 6611. We're going to first talk about homoskedasticity, that equal variance assumption, and some possible transformations that might address it in a few contexts. We'll then focus a lot more in depth on log transformations because those tend to be used more frequently and they have some interesting interpretation considerations. We'll also briefly finish with a slide on transformations that could be considered to address issues with nonlinearity. Let's first revisit this assumption of homoskedasticity. This is an important assumption about equal variances, especially if we're trying to use our regression analysis for prediction. Transformations of our response variable, or the dependent variable y, are often used to try to remove some of this heteroskedasticity. This type of transformation is generally known as a variance stabilization transformation, and a variety of them exist. One that we'll focus again a little more on is taking the natural log of the response variable. This is especially useful if we have heteroskedasticity where the residual variance is an increasing function of x, or there's a fan or a funnel shape. Other transformations are sometimes used to also stabilize the variance, but they may ultimately give a model that may be more difficult to interpret. For example, we just have a couple transformations listed on the slide here. And we see a couple of the ways they have potential relationships. For example, if we see that the variance is proportional to the mean, which is what our little symbol here means, we might take a transformation of the square root of our outcome y. This is frequently used if we have Poisson data, where we're assuming that the mean and the variance should be equal. Or maybe our variance is proportional to something like the mean times 1 minus the mean. In other words, something that kind of looks like a binomial proportion variance or something dealing with rates. In this case, we can take an inverse sine of the square root of y as a transformation. Another common one is that the variance is proportional to the mean squared, where we can take the natural log as our transformation, or log y here, which we'll also we'll see at the very end can be used for nonlinearity or non-normality issues. One of the catches, though, is that your outcome y must be greater than zero because we can't take the log of a negative value. Similarly, if the variance is proportional to our expected value of y to the third or fourth power, we may take things like the inverse square root or just the inverse as a transformation to try to remove some of this heteroskedasticity that may be present. So with that in mind, let's really dig deeper into a log transformation example with a continuous and also categorical predictor. We're specifically going to focus again on our FEV data set, where we're going to try to predict the outcome of FEV based on, starting here, age as a continuous predictor. We see for the code that we have a line reading in a CSV file with the given data, as well as then fitting with the GLM function, our linear regression model. The rest of the code below here is to fit the four diagnostic plots that we'll, we will review on the following slide. So a few things that we can note that are of greatest concern here is this sort of funnel pattern we see in the scatter plot and also the residual plot, where it appears that there is some unequal variances that are increasing as age gets older. This then leads us to be concerned that that assumption of homoskedasticity may be violated. We could also note as well that our normal PP plot also has a bit of a deviation around the diagonal line. It looks a little higher or above the line earlier on and then gets a little below the line um, towards the middle and later on. So what we may wish to do is try to take that natural log transformation. Again, we can remember that log 
in R is going to be by default the natural log and so that's sort of what we're using whenever we use log unless we explicitly note that it's supposed to be something like base 10 or base 2. We can see here one nice thing about many R functions is that we can again combine functions within the one function itself and so we don't have to define unless we want to the natural log of FEV outside of the GLM function we can actually define it within the function itself. Then what we see here below for our code again is just recreating those four plots that we're going to review to see if this transformation helps at all with that issue of heteroscedasticity. And the good news is, is that it does appear to have helped on multiple fronts. We see of our scatter plot of just age compared to the log of FEV, it looks to be more equally distributed across the different age values for the variance within any one age. It also looks more like there's a general sort of distribution in our residual plot with the jackknife residuals by H as well, or at least there's not as much of that funnel shape anymore. Also good news is that our normal PP plot appears to be even more normally distributed than before, and our jackknife residual histogram appears to be centered at zero with most of the observations seeming to closely follow that uh, overlaid normal distribution in blue. So with the thought that maybe we've addressed some of our distributional concerns, we can look at the interpretation of our long transformed result. When we have a logarithmic transformation of our dependent variable, the model will now be interpreted on the scale that we've done the modeling on. For example, we have the coefficients from our GLM with an intercept beta naught of 0.05 and an age effect or the slope of 0.087. We can write this here as in our expectation form of our equation that the expected um, log FEV is equal to 0 0.0506 plus 0 0.0871 times age. Now with respect again to that transformed outcome log of y, we have the usual interpretation. The intercept of 0 0.0506 is the mean or average log FEV value for someone who is age zero. Again, we may want to be worried here, though, about the concerns with extrapolation, because in our data set we have no one who is actually age zero. The slope term here indicates that for each one year increase in age, on average, log FEV will increase by 0.0871 units. Now, the limitation here is that these aren't really intuitive or generally super useful on the log scale. And usually we'd like to interpret our results, if possible, on the original scale. Fortunately, with the log transformation, we have a really nice property when we back transform to the FEV scale. For example, we can just exponentiate our betas. And so if we take our equation we had on the previous slide for our expectation of the regression fit, we can then raise all of that term to the E e to the 0 0.0506 plus 0 0.0871 times age. However, there are some more caveats. Our transformed estimates no longer represent what we're used to interpreting as the arithmetic mean. Instead, we're actually going to be calculating what's known as a geometric mean. So again, just writing this out a little more here, taking those exponential pieces, we now have our e to the beta naught, our intercept represented by 1.052 and our e to the beta 1 represented by 1.091 still raised to the age based on the properties of exponents. What this means though on the multiplicative scale or the geometric mean is that for our slope for each year of age FEV will increase on average 1.091 times or increase approximately 9% per year. Again, we're getting to this multiplicative interpretation where your increase in FEV will be 1.091 times whatever it was last year on average, or again, sometimes it's nicer to think of it in terms of a percentage increase or decrease. From our equation, we can also address other questions that may be of interest relating to our coefficients and their back transformation to the original FEV scale. For example, we may say, what's the expected geometric mean for a zero-year-old? And in that case, we would just take our e to the beta naught hat, that 1.052, and we'd say it's 1.052 liters is their geometric mean. 
Likewise, if we wanted to know someone who maybe wasn't extrapolating beyond a range of the ages we've observed, or at zero years old being something that maybe is biologically implausible to measure anyway, we may say, what's the expected geometric mean for a five-year-old, since they are included in our sample? In this case, we would just take our equation like we would normally and plug in the value of interest for age, and we do the math there, and we would calculate that the expected geometric mean for a five-year-old is 1.626 liters. Finally, we may want to interpret just the effect of the slope term. So for example, we may say, what's the estimated percent increase in FEV for a difference in five years between any two individuals? For example, going from five to 10 years or seven to 12 years old. In this case, we can then just focus on our exponent beta one term, 1.091, raise that to the five, and we'll note we get an answer of 1.546. Or in other words, there's a 54.6% increase for any difference in five years from one person being five years younger to five years older. We're also able to still calculate confidence intervals for our terms even though we have to transform some components. For example, if we look at the overall coefficients table um, on our log y scale or the log FEV scale, we can still calculate a 95% confidence interval for the slope or the intercept. For example, we'd first calculate on the log FEV scale using our traditional format of 0 0.0871 plus or minus a critical value times 0 0.0028, and we'd see that the 95% confidence interval for our slope for age on the log FEV scale is 0.082 to 0 0.093. All we have to do at that point is simply exponentiate our values here for the next step, and we then see that our estimate will be 1.085 to 1.097 on the original FEV scale with that geometric mean or multiplicative interpretation. Or if we wanted to tie it all together in a brief but complete summary, we might state something like, there is a significant increase in FEV for a one-year increase in age. On average, FEV increases by 9.1% with a 95% confidence interval from 8.5 to 9.7% for every one year increase in age. In addition to interpreting a continuous predictor, we can also look at categorical predictors very similarly. In this case, let's look at a subset of the data for those who are 14 years or older and then look at smoking status since we have no people who report being a smoker under the age of 14. In this case, if we fit the model on the log FEV scale, we get our coefficient estimate table here from R from the GLM function. Again, we can write this out in our maybe expectation uh, notation, the expected value of the log FEV, and then we can look at taking the exponentiated version of that, which maybe we'll denote by E star to say that it's not just FEV as we normally think of it, but we're trying to some way distinguish that something's happened here, that it's actually on our, in this case, the geometric mean or multiplicative scale. With a categorical predictor, we know that in this case, it's a binary, either smoker or non-smoker status. And based on our output here, we see that the variable smoke is for one equals to smoker. And so for non-smokers then we would just inter interpret that intercept, that their geometric mean FEV is estimated to be 3.768 liters. And if we were interested in estimating then the geometric mean uh, for its smokers, we would just take that intercept times in that coefficient um, e to the beta one, or we'd see that it's 3.308 liters, so a lower geometric mean on average, which should not be surprising given the robust medical and public health knowledge we have of what smoking does to one's health. We can also summarize these results in the variability by calculating a confidence interval for the difference between smokers and non-smokers. And in this case, it's an interesting example because we have the situation we had a negative beta coefficient for beta one on the log FEV scale, or on our FEV scale, it's less than one. So again, here what we can see in this case, instead of something like 1.2 being a 20% increase, we take one minus our proportion here, our 
fraction value, 1 minus 0.878, and we multiply it by 100, we now can say that the difference is smokers will have a 12.2% lower mean FEV. Further, we can calculate the 95% confidence interval on our original log scale and then exponentiate it below to use a similar approach to calculating that difference. In other words, we could say that we're 95% confident that FEV is between 3% and 21% lower in smokers compared to non-smokers. And in a brief but complete summary format, there is a significant association between smoking status and FEV, P equals 0.0153. On average, FEV is 0.878 times lower with a 95% confidence interval of 0.79 to 0.97 in smokers compared to non-smokers. Or, again alternatively, we could have presented it as the FEV is 12.2% lower and given the confidence interval in terms of percentages if in the context it was more meaningful or made more sense. And so with those examples for the log transformation out the way, we're going to introduce in our last slide some additional transformations that may help to address issues that arise if we evaluate our assumptions and are concerned about nonlinearity. So one important thing to note is that linear regression methods can be used to model curves as long as those curves can be represented or expressed in a linear fashion. The following are examples of curvilinear relationships that we can estimate using linear regression models, and we'll also talk about some of these in greater detail later this semester. The first thing we can note here in our top bullet point is actually the same transformation we just used before, which is log transforming the outcome, the dependent variable y. We also have a similar transformation below where we can take y squared relative to the square root of our predictors there. The downside to that one is that there's not as nice of an interpretation as there is with the natural log transformation and back transforming to y. What we see then as well is that we have options where we can actually take the log transformation of our predictor variables to potentially address nonlinearity, or we can add higher order polynomial terms to also try to address potentially curvy linear relationships. Transformations of our independent variables are usually performed again to address the nonlinearity or potentially to reduce any points of leverage or influence and not necessarily to address issues with non-normality. We can also further note that the independent variables do not need to be normally distributed. And in fact, we've already seen this multiple times by the fact we've used categorical variables as independent predictor variables, which by their definition are far from normally distributed. And so with that, we'll conclude the lectures for this week, and note that we'll come back to some of these considerations later on to explore the other issues with polynomial regression and other types of transformations.